Hello and good morning everyone. My name is Lynn Kammerlin and I'm here with Professor Sven Ledin from Lund University. And we're at the Grand Hotel in Stockholm, continuing the International Dialogue Project on behalf of the Young Academy of Europe. Sven, good morning. Thank you very much for being here. It's, it's great to talk pleasure. to you. Thank you. So I think if we start, you were born in Lund in the 60s, the decades of love, peace and understanding. And as we might see off camera, some of that love, peace and understanding <laughs> remains today. Tell us what it was like growing up in Lund. Well, I was born outside of Lund. Mm -hmm. So in a small farming village, mm -hmm. um, 50 souls, and I guess 49 now that I have moved out. Um, it was very quiet. Uh, Lund was the, was the big smoke. That's where you went for, for on big occasions. Um, I went to local school in the, school in the countryside and, and really pretty much the first time I went abroad was, um, was as an exchange student to Chicago, which was a bit of a change. Uh, but it was a, it was a, it was a quiet life. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a um, very rural. How was Chicago if you come from a... Slightly more urban. <laughs> <laughs> um, colder, windier, very exciting, mm -hmm. and uh, and it taught me a lot about it taught me a lot about my background to be in Chicago, mm -hmm. because I had I had the preconceived idea that the states was pretty much like Great Britain, mm -hmm. only slightly so like Western Great Britain, yeah. and and I found out that it's a it's a very different place. Um, not different as in better or worse, but very different. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, it got me, it really got me thinking about the fact that it is an important experience in life to, to be exposed to that sort of, to those differences at an early age. To, because then you, you don't understand what's going on around you, but you do get a better understanding of why people actually behave differently. Mm -hmm. um, because we are raised differently and it makes us, it has a huge impact on us and the earlier you're exposed to that, I think the better. And I think also, if you think of the timing, because nowadays in the combination of cheap air travel and social media, people fly around so much, but back then it was really rare to get the opportunity, so young also. Yes, and I, I do believe that perhaps we are traveling less today. Really? Because, well, the typical way of traveling is you go to a tourist resort which is which is completely denationalized mm -hmm. it's 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 a it's an area where people people go abroad but they stay in a in a familiar surrounding the the weather is different but you don't really get exposed to the people who live there. You will go for sightseeing and look at, at the, all the wonderful things that these people did a thousand years ago, but you very rarely interact yep. with, with people who are not used to interacting with the tourists. Um, yep. And that makes a huge difference. Now, living in another country, is, is a, is a, that's the big thing, to, to really expose yourself. I think when I was young, Euro railing mm -hmm. was a big thing. I, I haven't kept up, I have no idea whether it is today or That was a great way of going about because you would be, you would really be exposed to what it was like to, the railway is a good way of measuring a country. Mm -hmm. You will see, well, so this is how we do it here. Uh, are you allowed to sleep on the, <laughs> on the railway benches? Uh, do, people, uh, do people actually read the signs? Mm -hmm. If it says no smoking, what does that mean in Sweden? What does that mean in France? What does that mean in Italy? What does that mean in Germany? Mm -hmm. Completely different things. Yep. Very educational, very interesting. And again, different, not right or wrong, but just a different attitude. And when it comes to differences, because you traveled very far, you actually went behind the Iron Curtain in the 1980s and went to Russia. How was that? Now, that was, that was an absolutely tremendous experience to me. Um, I, was, I was taking Russian in high school mm -hmm. and um, this was 1980 and, and so Moscow was preparing for the Olympics and uh, again I had heard of, uh, of Pachomkin and, and uh, the Pachomkin sets mm -hmm. and this was, this was experiencing that first hand. So the city was being prettified 
uh, all along the main thoroughfares. And then if you just went one block away, it was, it was the Soviet Union of the 80s yep. still. So that was very interesting. It was also very interesting to see how How shall I put this? Um, things, things were about to change. Mm -hmm. That was clear. Uh, there, was, there was a movement away from, from the old, but there was still... No one had really noticed yet. Yep. Um, the, the sort of the imminent fall, that was just, it was just... It was less than 10 years away. Mm -hmm. Still, there was a... Still, there was uh, no real, there was no premonition that this was, was about to happen so soon. Mm -hmm. And I can see that, I think, I think to me, the, the most telling thing, I was, when I did my postdoc in Germany, mm -hmm. um, my, my boss there, Hans Georg von Schneering, yep. was, he was born in East Prussia. Mm -hmm. and. The wall actually came down when I was in Germany. I mean, it was a wow. great experience. And, and he said that this, this day is, is, I mean, it was, for him, it was a fantastic experience. This was what he had been longing for since the Second World War. Um, and, and he said something very, very insightful, I think, that, that for me, this is a day of happiness. For all the young people of Germany, it is a day of joy. For everyone else, it's a catastrophe. Because all the people who were then living in Eastern Germany and who suddenly had the experience that their, their entire world had been a lie. And of course, that wasn't true. But again, the victors write the history. And so suddenly everything about Eastern Germany was wrong. Of course, there were many things in Eastern Germany that were horrible, but there were, there were good things there. Mm -hmm. Uh, not dependent on on a crazy political system, but depending on the fact that people find ways of dealing with the situation. Mm -hmm. Some of these ways were really good ways, um, and it's very difficult to to be thrown out of a life that you have led for forty years, and to be told that nothing of that Was has real. any relevance. Have you seen the movie Goodbye Lenin? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought of. It's yes, and and, and I mean it's a, it's a it's a wonderful movie. Uh, it's uh, and and I mean the the whole humanity angle of this, the fact that too much change is a very dangerous thing, and it makes it even what even what seems to be changed for the better isn't necessarily good if it's too much. Exactly. Do you have children or? Oh, I've got three girls. Um, how old were they? They were born before or after the wall fell. Uh, my eldest is twenty-one. Okay. So. So there. So your children will never know what it means. Really, understand what it means to have a divided Berlin, for example. No. Uh, it, it, it was one of the things I promised myself when I was in Germany that this is something I have to tell them, although they will never understand it. I will have to try to explain to them the fact that you couldn't. There was a line that you couldn't cross. Yeah. That was really, someone had really drawn a line in the sand saying, you can't cross that line. And what's even worse, of course, was that, well, if you lived in the West, you could cross that line and go back. But it was, it was a bit of, it, it required a bit of work. But if you were born on the wrong side. You were locked. You were absolutely landlocked. And that's, I think it is important to explain that to them. It's also, I mean, just like it's important to explain about the Second World War. Yeah. And what happened during that time, because there is, we have so much to learn from these catastrophes. But, but most importantly, how quickly things change. Yeah. The fact that the whole, the whole Eastern Bloc construction crumbled so quickly. And it's also very interesting to see how a few isolated happenings mm -hmm. were so crucial for this. Yeah. So the... The event of the of the Hungarian picnic that ended up in in Austria. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that could have ended very very badly. Yeah. And luckily enough, the people who were guarding that border 
uh, didn't interfere. And so the whole thing went, went, went very smoothly. And it really led, that was one of the things that led to, the, to what was a collapse. Yep. Um, but to live through that time was, was very bewildering. And, and um, I listened to an interview with, with um, uh, Petr Eriksson, the, the historian. Yeah. And he said something that, of course, I had never thought about because he's a very smart man and, and he's an historian and I am neither. <laughs> and, but he said the fact that when, when someone asked him about how can we understand people in former times, and he said it's so much easier to understand people in former times because we know what happened. We can't understand today because we don't know where we were headed. Yeah. And so it's very difficult to make an evaluation of what's going on today. It's much easier to know what happened in the, in the 17th century because we know exactly where, where things were going and it's all very logical. Exactly. Although we are in the middle of, of a great many things happening, in 100 years it will be so obvious what went wrong and what went right and why that happened. But today we're blind to that because we do not have the answers. It's That's true. going off on a tangent. No, but it's true. It's really true. <laughs> but we control where we end up. It's just that when we're doing it, we don't understand it. Mm -hmm. Going to one more radical geographic shift, because you've, we've covered from Chicago through to Sweden, Germany, Moscow. You're also in Canberra. Yes, yes. That was a, that was a wonderful time. Um, <clears throat> uh, while one of the states is is a foreign country. Um, to Swedes, Australia really isn't. You really feel that you are home. Uh, it's, it's very exotic. Uh, the fauna and flora is, is, is like out of a, out of a movie. Um, the language is some sort of flavor of English. But people are, people are very recognizable. Um, they're like, they're like sociable Swedes, which may be sort of an oxymoron, <coughs> but, but um, um, so no, I really, I really enjoyed Canberra. Uh, it, was, it was a great experience from, from, from so many different perspectives. Um, at the time, I was, I was still doing my PhD, and, and so I was working on a largely mathematical project, um, and applied maths in Canberra is, is a fantastic place. Uh, it certainly was then. I'm sure it still is. Um, and I met some some very interesting people. I, I learned some very interesting techniques. I learned I learned a lot of mathematics, but I also learned I really learned to appreciate Australia as a country. And so we we didn't travel that widely. We were young and poor, but we went up to. We went down to Tasmania, we went up to Queensland, we didn't go west. It's, mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of west to go when you're in Canberra. So we went as far as, as Melbourne, but, but not any further. But, but that was, uh, it was a fantastic experience. It was, it was really, um, if, you want to, if you want to travel and still stay at home, Australia is the place. Although it's, it's, a, it's a long way to go. And it's that a time, I think it was 48 hours to get there. Whoa. <laughs> I'm going for the first time <coughs> next summer, and it's 21, so I should be happy. You should be very happy. You should be very happy. 21 hours is nothing. That's a <laughs> but so Australia is also about as far as you can get from a small farming community outside Lund. Well, Canberra really isn't. It must be the only capital in the world where there are regular commercials for sheep dip on television. Really? Yes. <laughs> so it's... I guess Canberra has grown since then. Mm. Uh, I haven't been to Canberra for, for quite a while, but at that time it was just a few hundred thousand inhabitants. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really, you still had the feeling this was, this was sort of newly constructed out of nothing. Uh, Canberra was the sort of place where you could, go to, you could go to a public toilet on a Saturday evening and it was clean. That, that's, that's, how, that's how strange this place was. It was, uh, everything was sort of spick and span, everything was new. Um, and people were city proud in that and case. And people were very proud of this, yes. Very interesting place. <laughs> but if we go back now to... I shouldn't call your uh, neighbours and relatives the sheep farmers in Lund, but since... <laughs> <laughs> Mostly pigs. <laughs> but if we go back to 
to learn. So tell me a little bit about your family, your parents, your siblings. Do you have any? Yes. Well, like most people, I had two parents. <laughs> uh, I also have a, a sister. So um, my mother was a teacher of English. Mm -hmm. uh, she passed away a few years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, my father was uh, a judge, or is. Okay. Uh, he's he's still very much alive, but he's he doesn't practice law anymore. He's now eighty five, so that's. But I assume not based in this farming community of fifty people. Well, they were very early. They were very early on the sort of the green train. Okay. Uh, so leaving the city and going out into the countryside. Mm -hmm. So they they bought a, a a very rundown old farm where were actually all the all the economy buildings had been torn down, so it was just the, the main house left. Mm -hmm. And they spent, uh, well, I spent the most of their lives uh, knocking that into shape or mm -hmm. having people knocking that into shape for them. Um, it's still only, it's 10 kilometers from Lund, so it meant that when, as I got older, I could, I could take my bike and go into Lund for, yeah. for, uh, for entertainment. Um, my my parents were, they took a very early decision on, 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 on staying in this mm -hmm. small community and, and that of course affected their, their career choices. They, they yep. decided this is where we want to live, this is, from, from here we'll have our base of operation. And um, so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't ever involved in, in, in their planning but, but I, I, have, I have realized from snippets I heard as a kid that they they had several possibilities of moving elsewhere, of, 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 of getting perhaps interesting new challenges, and yep. they choose not to because they, they wanted this basis and it, it also provided a, a, very, uh, a very safe haven for us when we grew up. I, you described to me earlier the way you grew up and it's sort of, it's, it's, the, it's the opposite of, of, of that. And, and, uh, um, I think I think it provided me both with with a great security in in, in during my childhood, mm -hmm. but also with with an urge to travel. Yeah. Because I've so I've done the small farming community. I've been there. I've seen that, and and there are other things to see in life. Um, my sister is is um, is working for the Swedish Church in mm -hmm. in, in Malmo. Okay. So very different career choices. Very different career choices. You're an academic and to many people being a professor is a bit like having a Peter Pan complex that you never grow up from being a student. <laughs> Do the people in your private <coughs> community consider you to have a real job? Probably not. Um, I'm, I, I'm not sure they ever considered my father to have a real job. Because he doesn't use his. Because no, I, th I think I think being a judge wasn't really. Um, it wasn't a professional job. Mm -hmm. It was more of a more of a social thing. To be a teacher was different because, because that's that's dealing with children. But and they don't understand you're a teacher as well. You're a professor. Yes. So so there's there's a certain. There's a certain nimbus about the world, word, and and of course there's uh, there are preconceptions about professors having to be absent-minded, preferably bald, definitely male. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> and and um, so it took me a while. I'm I'm starting to lose my hair now. I was, I, I, I got my first chair in Stockholm when I was 35. Then I still had plenty of hair. And since then I raised three children, and so. That's <laughs> With each of them a little bit more. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> A little bit wiser and a little bit bolder, yes. <laughs> but um, but I do believe that this is one of the things that have really changed during during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. the, the the way we, or perhaps just the way I look at being a professor, but because of course it's it's different from the inside and the outside. But but it's very clear that 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 job today is so much more about social skills mm -hmm. than it used to be. Um, it's very clear when we, when we hire people that we look for those who do not only have the scientific ability but can else also interact with others. Um, there are few subjects where you can even function unless you 
can make others do the work for you because you have to do the admin. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think most importantly, the way that science is developing, it, it is becoming hugely collaborative. You, yeah. there, is no one who can, there is no one who can have a complete grasp of the whole field of chemistry. Yeah. But at the same time, if you want to write an interesting paper, you want that to happen in a way that encompasses a large part of the field. Yep. Uh, and so <clears throat> you can't be a good theoretician, expert at all experimental methods and a good synthetic chemist at the same time. You have to make your choice. And then you have to find the right people to collaborate with. And you have to find a reason for them to collaborate with you. Yep. One of those reasons is you have to be good enough. Yep. The other reason is that you have to be likable enough. So no one will work with the person who is constantly uh, a pain in the ass. Uh, of course, they will not work with you if you're an idiot either, but, but, but you have to balance these things. Um, there, are, there are still a few possibilities for the loners. You can, if you are a really skilled developer of methods, you can do that. Uh, but you are going to be very narrow in what you do. You are going to be... Um, if you want your work exposed, which we all do, because I think being a scientist is also being an exhibitionist in, in some sense of the world, not necessarily by being extrovert, but by wanting to be noticed, definitely. Um, so if you want to be noticed, you have to do something useful. Um, and it's so much easier to do that if you are working with the people who are going to use what you do in their projects. Mm -hmm because you can't tell which way their science is going. They can tell you. And so it's only through them that you can become excellent. You, you can be good at what you do, but it's very difficult to tell what is going to be useful to others. Yep. And, and you are always working within that context. So with regard to interdisciplinarity, as you said, interdisciplinary science and interdisciplinary everything is becoming so important. But especially when it comes to research evaluation in natural sciences, we still follow very much the U model, where we look at the first and the last author. Mm -hmm. You sit on many panels of different levels. How is the interdisciplinarity working with modern research evaluation? Because you can't always be the last author if you have a 10 PI project. No, and it's working quite poorly, I think. Um, f as a career choice, being, being interdisciplinary is a, is a very dangerous choice. Um, first of all, you have the problem of authorship, mm -hmm. where there will be, there will always be a scrambling for first and last place. Um, and, but there are other issues which I think are, are even more difficult there. It's, it's something that I often discuss with, with PhD students. The fact that it's wonderful to be on an interdisciplinary project, because it means that you do your part, and you get to be part of something much larger, which will be much more visible. So this is excellent for your career. Unfortunately, however, if you have a 10-person collaboration, it's enough with one of them being really slow yep. to, to almost torpedo your, your PhD project because you are on a very strict schedule there. And so you may have all these wonderful results from the collaborative studies that you will never see, maybe ever being finished, because there is one person lagging behind. And the question is, so who is, who is in charge of this project? And if there are 10 PIs, there are 10 different answers to that question. And it's often very, very difficult for even the majority of that team to decide, no, now we're going to publish, now we're going to do this, and the fact that you people have not done your job just means that you're going to get left out yep. or we are just going to ignore your input. You will still be on the paper because you have sort of contributed, <clears throat> but now is the time to finish this. Um, what normally happens is that that project is sort of abandoned and you do something slightly different where you think you can finish it. Mm -hmm. So if you are lucky, you get into a, a working constellation and things are great. Um, you, will, you will get 
a lot of exposure to a lot of interesting techniques. You will meet a lot of people. It's very useful for you. But it's a great gamble because it could also go the other way. Um, the second thing is, of course, that <clears throat> being on a large project is, is dangerous in terms of evaluations. So, so I've seen your name on many papers, but then there is this very famous person who's also on the paper. And so, of course, he, because that's normally he, right, was certainly the person who did this, right? And he was good enough to let you in. And the fact that you may have been in the driver's seat for this project is difficult to tell. Uh, I think it's, it's really encouraging that thesis today normally carry a list of contributions yeah. where the supervisor signs on to say, well, yes, it, this, is a correct, this is a correct rendering of what happened. So the first two papers, those were my ideas and the student did the handiwork, right? And not even that very well. <laughs> Papers two and three, things started to change. And the, on all the ideas and all the work of the last papers came from the student. And I acted as, as an expert on the techniques, uh, which I probably ha still have a better command of than the student. But the student asked the questions. The student did the science. I did the technicalities. Now, if you can establish that, at the time of the writing of the thesis, there's, it's so much easier than trying to do that 10 years later when the student is applying for a permanent position. Mm -hmm. So even then, it's important because then it means that you can actually look at the papers from the, from the, from the thesis and say something about it. Because otherwise, it would be naturally assumed that this is all the work of the supervisor and you are along for the ride as a student. Um, and of course, having that documented means that it will be much more believable that you are in the driver's seat later in your career. But it's something that is very important that, that young scientists demand of the older scientists. Um, and it's important that the older scientists are honest in this respect so that, yes, this was the work of the student, but also, no, it wasn't. Because if, if you just, it's not, a, it's not a question of being generous, because that is wrong. It's a question of being honest. Yeah. Uh, because if you say that all students did all the work, well, you're not helping the ones who actually did. Um, and no one is going to believe it anyway. So it's, it's just you being monogamous and nice, right? That's, that's not the way to do it. But coming back to the question of, of interdisciplinary science, the third problem, is in the evaluations, how do you even, how do you even evaluate the, the different contributions if you are, if you're doing a paper in microbiology and there are contributions from synthetic chemistry, from X-ray crystallography, from spectroscopy and all the way to biology and you get a great paper together with all all the questions answered, no stones unturned. So who is going to referee this? Uh, how, do you, how do you even start? Because there, there are many techniques involved and the details of the techniques are crucial. If, if one of these hasn't been done the proper way, the, the whole beautiful building will collapse because there is something fundamentally wrong with how this was built. So you have to be able to evaluate the techniques. You also have to be, have to be able to evaluate the, the way the different techniques tie in together. So do they really contribute to the answer or, or are they in themselves micro studies that, that are interesting but don't really contribute to the larger question? All these things have to be taken into account when you're making the evaluation and most people don't have the time to do that. They will, they will read the beginning and the end of the paper and they will decide whether they like this or not. If they don't like it, they won't read it anymore and they will just say this was garbage. If they, if they like it, they may read a bit more and they will try to penetrate how the work was actually done. And then they will find that, well, 
can't really evaluate all of this because I don't, I don't fully understand all the techniques. So I need to ask someone else. But people rarely do. They don't want to bother anyone else. So they, they, they just say, well, the things I can look at are good enough. Or even worse, this is good enough. Um, <clears throat> this is... This makes it difficult in evaluation. Particularly, it makes it difficult if, if you have projects where no one on the evaluation panel or the referee board um, feels comfortable with the work that you have done. Because there, you need someone to be your champion. You need someone to push for you in this. And this is particularly difficult when you're a young scientist. Mm -hmm. If you, as you get older, uh, you establish yourself in a particular position and it means that you get away with much worse science. Yep. Uh, simply because people are used to seeing your face and your name and they assume, well, this is probably good stuff uh, because people told me that the earlier work was good enough. And so unless you spot obvious mistakes, you're going to believe this is, this is good enough. Um, while if you're young, because of the stiff competition, everyone is looking for ways to trip you up. Uh, when you have success rates down in, the, in single digits, um, as an evaluator, you're very happy to find mistakes mm -hmm. because you have, to, you have to get this pile down from 100 applicants to nine, right? Yep. So the 91s that you are to sift out how do you do that? Well, preferably you do it by taking a quick look at all the applications. Okay, these 50, they've all made serious mistakes, right? So you look for the serious mistakes, the things that are going to fail these people. Then you have to take a more careful look at, at the next bunch. And there is no fairness in this, but it's just the way things work. And I think it's the way things have to work simply because of workloads. Mm -hmm. um, I... I'm, I'm worried about the fact that it means that we are, in most evaluations, we are really looking at bulk yeah. rather than quality. So we find that someone has published a lot of well-cited papers. Well, clearly that must be a brilliant person. Uh, rather than actually reading the best papers and, and evaluating for ourselves, is this a good paper or not? It's not good because a well thought of journal said it was good enough for us. It's good because you consider it good. I mean, for me, the, the only way to evaluate science is if I, find this, if I find this really exciting, then it's good science. If I don't, uh, well, then someone else has to tell me it's good science because if it doesn't, if it doesn't pique my interest, uh, how can I say it's good? And so then a challenging follow-up question, because we're talking about how you evaluate research. There's a very, very popular term at the moment, excellence, research centers of excellence, <coughs> excellence science. How do you define excellence? What is excellence? I was, I was working on a, uh, on a project at, at, at the Academy a few years ago, uh, which was exactly about this. It was a, it's, it's a very interesting question. There's, there is a, um, I have forgotten the author now. There, there, there's there's a, a really nice es essay with the title, What the Hell is Excellence? <laughs> and I think, it's, I think it's very elusive when you try to define it. Um, it has to do with something that is, that is out of the ordinary. Uh, one of the constraints is that it has to be high quality. But high quality and excellence are two different things. You can do very solid stuff that will not change anything, but, but it's well performed. Um, in order to be excellent, I think it also has to, it has to contain new ideas, new thoughts, uh, new possibilities. Um, and it has to be thorough enough so that you can see what is the next step. These are a few of the things that are required for excellence, but it's... I think it's like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, what is excellent to me may not be excellent to you. 
um, but I can probably convince you of things that are not excellent because I can find flaws. Um, and then even in the most excellent papers, in the most excellent theories, there are flaws. And so you have to decide how important are these. Uh, does this take us one step further? Or is it just a revamping of things we already know? Uh, I, would, I would not try to define excellence, although I have talked around that for a few, <laughs> for a few minutes now. Um, it's a very popular term. Uh, I do believe it is a meaningful term, but it eludes description. But we, I think to some extent we know what excellence is. Um, when we see it. When we see it, exactly. Uh, and perhaps that's the way, best way of defining excellence. Uh, I'll show you 10 excellent papers. I'll be prepared to do that. But I won't, I won't probably be able to tell you to give you a definition of the term. I can tell you why each one of these papers is an excellent paper. Uh, but not, but they will be quite different. So if we now rewind a little bit back to you in this context. So you've had a very mobile career. You've been to many countries and also within Sweden you've been very mobile. Tell me when you did something that for you was really out of the ordinary. In what context? In any context. <laughs> In any context. At every point you've had to choose. Everything was a choice. Each decision to move was a choice. Each scientific project was a choice. What's the most radical thing you think you ever did? Probably moving to Stockholm. Mm -hmm. uh, because that was... I think that was the most... That, that was a decisive movement in my career. It wasn't, it wasn't really a choice. It was, I was out of a job, and so I, I, would, I would apply for anything. It, it happened to be that there was a chair in Stockholm. I was, I was 34 at the time, so I, I had no, I certainly had no dream of getting that position, mm -hmm. but I realized I should, I should apply. Um, and I went to the interview, and this, this is something that, that I have thought a lot about. I went to this interview in Stockholm, for the for the position and um, and I knew that first of all I knew I didn't have a chance secondly I wasn't very interested uh, to be honest I didn't know that there was a university in Stockholm Stockholm University was completely unknown to me um, I knew about the the KTH I knew about Karolinska but I had never heard of Stockholm University it's it's it was then a, a very it's certainly known in Stockholm but it was rather unknown in, in the South. Um, and, and there was, very clearly, there was an attitude at the time that, that Stockholm University did very well in terms of recruiting from the local area, so they didn't need to be very visible. And of course, in the social scientists, in the social sciences, they were very well known, but, but in natural science, not really. Although there were some really, really excellent people there. Uh, but so I went there with the, well, it was nice to go on a trip to Stockholm. That was pretty much it. And, and so I do remember getting, getting very strict instructions for what I was about to do. I, I was to give a short presentation of my work and then I was to answer some questions. And so the first thing I did during this interview was, was to, to, to show the list and read it aloud to the people in the room and say, well, this is clearly impossible, as you must understand, so I'll do something completely different. And that got me the job, because I was, I was, I was being very self-assured for the simple reason that I knew that I hadn't got a chance and I didn't really care. Um, and in the end, of course, that meant that, that I was completely natural in that situation, which was a great asset, because if I had, had I been aware of what a wonderful place Stockholm University is to work. Um, I would have been scared shitless, but now I was I was completely calm, and 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 that is of course one of the one of the great tricks that if you the easiest way to get a job is not really to want it because then 
you are going to you're going to come across as a much more self-assured person than you really are uh, because I'm I really am not uh, but that was it was very decisive a very decisive moment because I was I was very scared when I then learned that I actually got the position um, I was I also realized that there was no backing away from it because I my my position in Lund was finishing in a in another year or so it was really time to go and and after a while I got used to the idea that this could be quite exciting and then as I said I, I really I really loved that I spent 15 years in Stockholm and and when I finally left it wasn't I didn't leave Stockholm I went to Lund that was that's a very different thing I'm still I still feel very much at home in Stockholm mm -hmm. I I, uh, I love the city it's it's uh, it's it's pretty it's nice and there are lots of nice people here I've got lots of friends here and and of course when you are in Sweden you always spend time in Stockholm if you're in science because this is this where is where the money happen. is yep. this is where things happen um, and of course I had still a few things to do at the Academy and so I went here regularly um, and I guess the last few years particularly during the the falls I've been going here at least once a week uh, you also realize of course that's the one of the problems of not living in Stockholm Uppsala is is is, is good enough that that's a one hour ride away but but being somewhere else means that you spend a lot of time traveling yeah. so you go to a meeting that means that day is gone yeah. when I was in Stockholm I would go to the to the Science Council uh, that would mean if there is a meeting between 9 and 12 it means well I'm blocked between 8.30 and 12.30 and the rest of the day is, is free if I'm going for the corresponding meeting now I have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning in Hi. order to make it yeah. um, and when I'm back home it's already evening so that's a big difference um, I think it's it's worth it I think it's for me it's really been worth it to to change locations more than once uh, to because coming back to Lund was really coming to a new place things had changed so much during the time that I was gone um, I'm I'm very happy about moving uh, but I'm very sad about leaving uh, so overall I would say that it's been it's that was a good experience but also um, it sets you back work-wise but it also means that I've had to take new directions which is which is very useful for you particularly when you're a bit older you don't do that automatically or well, I don't at least um, so so I would think that 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 was for me it was something still a little bit unusual to to make that transition to Stockholm uh, I might have been able to to stay in Lund uh, I think that there were possibilities um, but they weren't obvious enough so I I took the easy way out and went to Stockholm and I'm very happy that I did I I learned so many things during the first years here and uh, and I hope that I hope that is something that that I can I can convince others of uh, the fact that moving about is such a very very useful thing to do as you know very well <laughs> exactly and so, so then a final <coughs> question what would you like to say to my generation the members of the AI are typically newly established assistant professors through to very young professors early career so what would you like to say to us well um, first of all have fun that's the that's the main thing of it all uh, it's there will be many moments in your career that are not fun. Uh, if you, unless you are, unless you're exceedingly lazy, most of your applications are going to be turned down. You should always run for the money, of course, if it's good. You should never apply for things you don't want. You should never apply for money that you don't want, uh, and there is money that you shouldn't want. Um, but, but the important thing is that you have to stay you have to stay with projects that really interest you you have to you have to preserve your inner child uh, my my old supervisor who who is still is still alive uh, who is 
a rather unconventional person. Um, is is he's a man who's been able to preserve that that childish childish inquisitiveness throughout his life. I was when I was visiting a few years ago. Um, he had bought a video camera with a, a fancy video camera with with. Uh, with possibilities of making ultra quick um, movies for looking at birds in flight because he he had swallows under his roof and he was he was constantly wondering about how did they avoid collisions and so he started filming them and then watching this in slow motion and he found out that the swallows on Erland uh, have left-hand traffic, really? so they always swerve to the left. And and I'm sure this was well known, but he would be much too proud to try to look it up anywhere. So he had to find out for himself. But but just the just the fact that he would ask this question at the age of eighty plus, and not only would ask it, but but find that I have to find out. Um, of course, not reading the literature. It's something that he didn't do unless he had to. But, but actually performing the experiment, not really caring about publishing it or sharing it, but, but telling good friends. I now know that the swallows here use left-hand left hand traffic. I mean, that's, it's absolutely wonderful to, to maintain that sort of, of curiosity rather than, rather than just accepting things as they are. Uh, and, and if you can do that, I, you will continue to be successful. That's, that I'm, I'm sure of. Thank you so much. So it's been our pleasure to have Professor Ledin here today. Thank you for your time and thanks to all of you for watching. It's been a pleasure as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much.